morning. I'm going to ask some of the ministers to come join me on, on, on stage uh, today. And we're going to be we're going to be praying out one of our arrows. He's going to the Urban Training Center. Amen. And uh, you know this young man, he, he's a, he's a special guy, man. I got a lot of love for him. I, I know the Lord put him in my life and me in his life, and um, and we've seen the Lord doing awesome things in his family. And we've been praying for a you angel for a long time. And now here you go, Mijo. This is where I, what I've been trying to get you to do for so long, and here we are. And so we we celebrate. We're excited. So church, help me welcome angels. He makes his way up this morning. Uh, we're proud of you. We love you. And uh, we know God is going to do, you know, great and mighty things. Why don't you share what's going on in your heart right now? A lot of things are going on in my heart right now, honestly. Nervousness, excitement, joy, you know, mad. I got mad love. You know, I, I received a lot of love from every single one of you, from my pastors, from the leaders who stand up right here next to me. And, you know, truly, I'm just, I'm just in shock of, like, what's taking place within my life, you know, within this, this time that I've been in this church. You know, some, most of you, some of you have seen me from before. You know, I tore back on everything. You know, I was I was addicted. I was on fentanyl. I was in the streets. I was with the homies. I was staying from uh, place to place with so my friends and everything. And you know, things were just in a downward spiral. You know, and and just glory to God. Like Pastor said, like He's been wanting me to to get a hold of this for quite some time. And I've been rebellious to that because I didn't really want to accept God to my life. I thought I could do it within with myself. You know, but. I came to a place of surrenderance, and with that surrenderance, God has opened doors for me. You know, he's made, he's made changes in my perspective, in my ways I think, the ways that I want to, the things that I want to do. And, and I see I'm catching a vision, you know. I'm happy to say I'm catching a vision for what's about to take place. And I'm going to the UTC. This is actually going to be my last service with you guys. And, uh, man, I'm excited. I leave Wednesday morning in the morning. And, uh, man. Just power to God, you know, Brother Anthony, my director right here, he's been a great leader in the house, you know, just an example of, of the faithfulness of what God gives to you as you remain faithful, you know, he's been pouring into me, like, just tremendously, and, you know, I'm truly thankful for all the words which I shared with each and every one of you, and all the times you, you've spoken to me, you've guided me, and you put me back on the path of what I was supposed to be on, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, you know, truly, just thank each and every one of you. I wasn't prepared for this. Um, but God's been talking to me these past couple of weeks. I've reached out to some of the church. Um, Noah was actually born at 29 weeks, and he was in the NICU for 57 days. And I believe it was God that saved him and got him through that. Um, that is when I started coming here in 2021 and it's because of God it's all because of God and it takes God and a tribe and a family to be able to raise a little boy and I, I have my family here and my family here that can guide myself and Noah through this amen thank you Jesus Praise God. Well, I went to the Dodger game yesterday. Praise the Lord. And I had a good time with my brother Kenny. And, and he's got... <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, and Kenny's, uh, Kenny's son, Jacob, is in the house. Send him, mijo. He's one of our, our, uh, our America's fighting men. And we're, we're grateful for you. He's a U.S. Marine. And it's good to have you with us, Papa. And we had a good time in the... In, uh, in Chavez Ravine, and, um, you know, I'm not going to say pray for the Dodgers, but let's hope for the best. Amen. <laughs> right? And uh, so, uh, anyhow, I'm, I'm excited to, to, to preach the word of God to you this morning. And the title of my message is The Desires of God. The Desires of God. You know, I, I, I've come to realize, you know, being a pastor, that, that a lot of times, you know, people, we come to the Lord because of our desires. Sometimes it's, it's the needs in our life. Sometimes it's, the, uh, it's the, the, the desires that we have in our hearts that draw us to God. There's an emptiness, there's a need, there's a desire that we have that can get us close to God. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. 
But I, I wonder how many of us take time to, to recognize that God also has desires. There are desires that God has towards us. And I want to talk to you about a few of those desires this morning. I got six points. So I'm going to try to move fast. And I was at the women's home the other day. Me and Ruth. We, listen, we have a house full of women that God is restoring and changing and delivering at our victory home for women. And I'm so proud of them. And, um, you know, we have like kind of like a fresh crop at, at, in our women's home. I don't know if you've noticed. And we've also had several of the women uh, step out and move into the discipleship home. And they're getting ready for those next seasons in their life. But we're excited about what God's doing. And as I thought about my time with them, I was going, coming across some of these notes that I have. And so I just started working on them some more. And, I, and I, I'm excited to share with you this morning. The first one I want to I give you, the, well, the first desire of God is that God desires us to be forgiven. It's a desire. Understand me now, because this applies to all of us. Why does it apply to all of us? Because the Bible says that all of us fall short of the glory of God. That every one of us has sinned. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. So this applies to everybody. And it's important for you to know, as a sinner come on somebody as somebody that has been redeemed but you also still have the potential to sin i want you to know that god's desire is for you to be forgiven jesus lived a perfect life so that he could offer himself on the cross in your place as the only sacrifice that would that would satisfy god's justice for your sin he paid for you this morning. So when we think about that God has forgiven us, that he desires to forgive us, you have to be able to look at that in terms of God paid for you. You know, there's an example that I like to share that when I was in the men's home, somehow I got caught up one day and, uh, and I ended up being around the leaders and the pastor and a bunch of the leaders. Hey, well, come on, we're going to go eat. And men's home, come on, where you at? And... Uh, Hey, come on, somebody. <laughs> the men's home's on fire. And, and if you've ever been in that situation, and next thing you know, you're in the car with your leader, your pastor, you're like, oh, my God, how did I end up in this situation? I was in one of those situations, and I was all happy, excited just to be out of the van. Come on, somebody. Just to be in a different car. And go. And then we were in a restaurant. I was like, man, I haven't been in a restaurant in a, huh? So I was all happy. But then all of a sudden, man, the, re the realization hit me that, oh, my God, I don't have no money. <laughs> then I got scared. I was terrified. Like, oh, man, what am I going to do? And, oh, my God, and everybody's having fun, and they're looking at the menus, and I was like. <laughs> I even thought, man, I, I even thought, should I fake a sickness? Oh, I don't feel good. I'm going to go sit in the car. Like, you know, I don't know why I was just panicking so much. And, and I was so worried. Like, what am I going to do? I don't know money. Oh, my gosh. And I was sitting at the table, and I was biting my nails. And I was like, can I have water with lemon? Matter of fact, lemon with water <laughs> and crackers. You know, what else do you have? You know, you know, you know can I have some olives? You know, like, I, was, I don't know what I was going to do. And right there in the midst of my panic, somebody leaned across the table, and they made eye contact with me. They leaned over, and they said, And I said, <laughs> Someone say, he's got me. Come on, somebody say, he's got me. You know, that all of a sudden, that ugly, sinking feeling that I didn't have what it took, that I wasn't able to meet the needs of that bill. Somebody stepped in and said, don't worry about it. I got you covered. I'm going to do what you can't do. I'm going to pay what you can't pay because I want you forgiven. It was the desire of God that drove him to release his son to pay a debt that you could never pay. My God, he didn't do it because he had to. He did it because he wanted to. He didn't do it because somebody made him. It was a desire in his heart that his people would have a way. He's the way maker. Come on, somebody. 
Second Corinthians 5.21 says, He, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In John 1.29, John the, it tells us of a time that John the Baptist was out baptizing, and he was, he was doing what he did as a baptizer. And it says, the next day, That he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a powerful statement that John made right there. And I believe that wasn't something that he planned to say. I believe that was like a revelation hit him right there at that moment. Right in the middle of that. He probably had someone under the water and he was like. He said, there's Jesus, and he saw Jesus, and instantly in his spirit he knew. He said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus wants us forgiven. Jesus died so that God could demonstrate his love for sinners. And so that God's just punishment for sin could be placed on Jesus and not on you. Romans 5, 8 says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, somebody would dare to even die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, justified by his blood, justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God Through him. Somebody give the Lord Jesus a hand of praise this morning. 1 John 4.10 says, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the appropriation for our sins. God wants us forgiven. 1 Timothy 2.3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved. How many men? That he desires all men to be saved, men and women, men representing people there. Who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How many know we didn't deserve that forgiveness? Huh? It's, It's the grace of God. The Bible says those who have been forgiveth much, love much. I think that's why Victory Outreach is so radical. I, I think that's why you, you feel such a strong presence. I've talked to people that have gotten saved in Victory Outreach, came up in Victory Outreach, and then somewhere along the way they felt like they were too good for Victory Outreach. Hallelujah. Then they say, I'm going to this sophisticated mega church over here. Well, we worship God like this. And then I love all the churches. I'm grateful for every church. But there is something special about Victory Outreach worship. There's just, some, there's just something in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe some of our guys got some rough edges. Yeah, maybe, maybe you look around, you're going to see a few bald heads and tattoos. Hey, you know what that is? That's just proof that the miracle working power of God is in the house. And I would rather be somewhere where God is moving than somewhere that's dead in the spirit. Somebody say amen. Amen. And there's just something. That's why you could go anywhere. But you could say, this is nice. It's good. And there's plenty of parking. But I don't feel the spirit. Hallelujah. Right? Yeah, you're going to struggle for a parking spot when you come over here. Just for now, guys. Just for now. I mean, you know, our big building's on its way. Come on, somebody. It is the amazing grace of God. He bestowed it upon us. Amen. And we are grateful for it. The second thing, not only does God want us forgiven, but secondly, God wants us freed. He wants us freed. He wants us freed. John 8.32 says, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, this is Jesus said these words and he was talking to the Jews and, 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 and when you, if you go and read that passage there in John chapter 8, you see a little bit of an offense that kind of came upon the Jews. They say, wait a minute, man. We, we're the descendants of Abraham, man. We've never been enslaved to nobody. 
What do you mean he's going to set us free? We've never been in bondage. Huh? They, they really couldn't wrap their head around it because they were thinking about physical chains. And then in verse 34, it says that Jesus replied, very, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. And now a slave has no permanent place in the family. My gosh, that should scare somebody right there. He said, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. I mean, if you're knowingly practicing walking in sin, you, you better know this this morning, that you are a slave to sin. But that's not what God wants for us. God not only wants us forgiven, he wants us freed. He wants the chains broken off of your life. That's why some of you this morning, you were dancing, you were jumping. Come on, somebody. You said, man, at one time I was all shackled down. I was all chained down by my bondage and by my chains. But Jesus came and he broke the chains off of my life. That's the desire of God for you and I, that we would no longer be slaves to sin but free. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who gives us the victory. Huh? Now, you may be a Padres fan here today, so you don't have the victory. Huh? But you do have the victory in Jesus. What does that mean? That means even when things may seem not to go in the way you wanted them to go, you say, why didn't I get that promotion? Why didn't I get that job? How come my car got scratched last night? And you say, man, these may be areas where the victory is not present, but I'll tell you the victory you got on your trophy case that the devil can't take, and that's you got the victory through Jesus. You got someone say victory. When you look up that word in the Greek, that word is nikau, huh? where they get the word Nike. Come on, somebody. Did you know that? When you say, when you're rocking Nike, that's nikau. That means victorious. That means triumph. That means conquer. Jesus came to give us nikau over the enemy. He wants that for us, guys. He wants you walking free. He wants you delivered, man. He wants the chains off. He wants you walking in, in total victory. That's why he says you are more than conquerors through Christ. Amen. In Luke 4.18, Jesus gave us his mission statement. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. This was the mission statement of Jesus. He said, this is why I've come, man. I came to set the captives free. I came to bring some liberty. I came to open up some blind eyes. Hallelujah. He said, we see two words right there, captive and oppressed. What had you captive? Huh? What had you oppressed? What had you in chains? It doesn't matter because Jesus is able to break every single one of them. Someone say every single one of them. Oh, you, someone else needs to say it like you mean it. Say every single one of them. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Now, while Christ's followers still battle with sin, they are no longer slaves to it. Through the power of Jesus, his people can be set free from the bondage of greed, vanity, pride, pornography, addiction, abusive behavior, gluttony, selfishness, and every, under sin, every other sin under the sun. None of them stand a chance. So don't, please don't be the one over there suffering in silence. Over there feeling like, and the devil's telling you, you can't break free from this. You're trapped in this. These chains are too heavy. These chains are not like everybody else's. You're stuck, man. You're never going to be free. You're never going to be whole. You're never going to have the victory. I'm telling you, the devil is a liar, and you need to believe the word of God this morning. I hope that scripture, you grab it, and you take it in because he wants you forgiven, and he wants you freed. Come on, somebody. 
Give the Lord a good hand of praise this morning. I'm free, I'm free, free, I'm free. He wants you forgiven. He wants you freed. And guess what? He wants you filled. He wants, we're talking about the desires of God this morning. This is what God desires for us. He desires that we be forgiven. He desires that we be freed and he desires that we be filled. Acts 9, 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And after laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> can, I, can I tell you, man? One of my favorite things about serving the Lord is being filled with the Holy Spirit. What a gift, man. See, some people, they haven't really experienced it yet. So to them, it's when you hear, they hear this kind of talk and they, someone invites them to church or they, they think right away religion, you know. And yeah, there's, you know, all these, you know, all this, this, the things that come with being the body of Christ and we're still working things out. We don't got it all right. You know, we're, we're, we're just doing our best. But I'll tell you what is here. It's the Holy Spirit is in the house. What a gift that we have. Huh? What a gift that we have in the Holy Spirit. I wish I had time this morning to preach on the Holy Spirit. I got a message called, My Friend, the Holy Spirit. Just talking about all the things that he is and does, right? We have a gift in the Holy Spirit, and it's the, it's the desire of our Father that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. Huh? Not just a little bit. You know when you get to the end of the cup, there's this like little drop to let. And like, doop, one little drop. God wants you filled. Overflowing. Come on, somebody. At capacity. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He told them, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight. You know what that is to me? That's forgiveness. You're gonna what, what was broken? We're gonna we're gonna put back, huh? You you were blind, but now you see, you got salvation. You're forgiven. But he doesn't want to stop there. He wants you to regain your your sight and be in right standing. He wants reconciliation, but he's also gonna fill you with his Holy Spirit. That's so heavy to me. Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Man, the Holy Spirit empowers you to do what you can't do in your own strength. The same way we saw when it hit the Apostle Paul. Why, why did the Apostle Paul need that? He said, I'm going to restore your sight. You've already had an encounter with me. You're saved and you're, you're right standing. I'm changing your name. But that's not all. I've got something for you to do. You're going to do my work. You're going to put your hands to the plow. And for that, I'm going to fill you with my Holy Spirit. Why did the disciples have that upper room experience? Because God had work in store for them. Why is God desiring to fill Victory Outreach West Covina? Because he's got work for us to do. He said, I want you filled to speak the word of God with boldness. The next point, he wants you, who remembers what the first one was? Forgiven, freed, filled. He also wants us formed. He wants you formed. Catch this, church. Because some of us, we stop, you know, along the way. You know, okay, I'm forgiven. Boom, there it is. It's all good in the hood. Huh? When, when the rapture comes, I'm gone. You know? That's all, you know. But, but this is a progressive work. This is something that there's more. That's why, that's why Ananias told Paul, Paul... He, he wants to restore your sight, but he's not going to stop there. Some of us here today, we've had our sight restored, but we haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. Tell the person next to you, don't stop. And after, fill, after being filled, he wants us formed. What does that mean? That means to be worked with and to be discipled. 
Isaiah 64, 8 says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Give the Lord a praise for that. What, what a declaration, huh? What insight, man. What a picture for you and I. He says, Lord, you're, you're our father. We're, we're just the clay in your hands and you're the potter. We're the clay. You're the one at the wheel molding and shaping. It's not the clay that determines what it's going to do. It's the potter when he places his hands and he molds and he shapes. Making some vessels for this and some vessels for that. And Don't get mad because I got some nice design on my vessel. Come on, somebody. Let me do that again. Huh? And they would compliment me. And Luke had some saucy Dodger jerseys on at the game. People were like, yeah, I like that jersey. We're like, you know, don't get lost in the sauce, I told him. You know? <laughs> He's the potter. So what is it? What do we take from that right there when we say, okay, well, God's the potter and we're the clay. That means he's in charge. And if we let him, he'll form us and shape us to be what he wants us to be. Amen. Galatians 4.19 says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Until Christ be formed in you. We are being made into the image of God. Hallelujah. So great, we come to a point where we believe, we come to a point where we're forgiven and we're filled, but also let's let God continue the work of forming us into the vessel that he's called us to be. There is a development process going on in you. Somebody needs to take that right there. Because you say, man, I feel like I'm just still like ugly and out of shape and weird, but he's not done yet. Right? Well, how come I'm not sure? How come I'm not zooming and zamming and moving in my gifts? Hold on. God is working in you. He's the potter at the wheel. You can't rush the process. Just be pliable. Just be there when he's ready to work. Just stay on the wheel. Come on, say stay on the wheel. I think that's half the battles won if we stay on the wheel. We got too many people jumping out the potter's wheel and making a run for it. We see your little clay feet print, boop, 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 going out. Where's the clay? We see the little feet print, out the door, down Francisquito. Well, where, where'd they go? Back to the hood, back to that relationship, back to the problems, back to the old man. Listen, I want to tell you this morning, Victory Hour, he said, if you let him, God will make a masterpiece out of you. If you let him, God will do a beautiful work in your life, but you got to stay on the wheel. He's forming our character. He's forming our convictions. He's forming us. It's not just about jumping up and down. It's not just about passing out flyers. It's not just about looking good. God wants his people to have staying power. God wants his people to have character. God wants his people to have convictions. He's trying to mature some people here this morning. You know what I got so encouraged? Because we got an awesome church. Man, you know, we celebrated our five-year anniversary. And as we started looking back at everything, and God has done some amazing things. But I really feel like the best thing our church has going for it is the people. You know, and I, and I, get, a, I, 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 get, I look good sometimes for it. Huh? Oh, Pastor Ezra, man, Vic Drives West Covina. I'm like... Yeah, but it's our people. We got good people in the house of the Lord. Okay? Here, now, here's where I get encouraged. Because I'm like, oh, wow. If we're just five years in, look, look at this. is our 9 a.m. service, guys. We got an 11 a.m. service and a 1 p.m. service. And, and I said, man, if this is where we're at right now, where are we going to be in eight years, in ten years? As more of you start to mature and grow and you say, man, I'm done jumping off the wheel, baby. I'm going to stay put. And guess what happens when you stay put? Then God gets to work. I can only imagine. Amen. He wants to build our character. He wants to build our convictions. Huh? First, First Corinthians 4.16 says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I said... 
you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. Here we have the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, I urge you. When you hear that, it's almost like he grabs him by the shirt. Hey, listen to me, man. Grabbing someone by the shoulder and said, listen, I'm urging you. Imitate me. Walk the walk. Stay focused. Let him have his way in your life. Praise the Lord. And the next, the next point, let's go to the next point for the sake of time. God desires for his people to be functioning. He wants us forgiven. He wants us freed. He wants us formed. And he wants us functioning. What do I mean by that? God has a specific calling upon our lives as individuals. You believe that? God has a specific calling. At first, when I first got saved and I was a baby Christian, I had a, I had a hard time believing that. Okay, everybody has a plan. Everybody's in, right? I just couldn't wrap my head around it. It didn't, it didn't make sense. I thought, no, you know, God, he provided a way, and there's the sprinkling of the blood. I get my, my blood, and, and I just live my life. And some people will do that. But I'm telling you that there's more. And that if you let him, he'll lead you. And he has a specific calling upon our lives as individuals. You've often heard me say that God is big enough to be small enough. And when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that Jesus had a mission. Jesus had a mission. As a matter of fact, we could say that Jesus was mission-minded. He was a mission-minded individual. In Isaiah 9, 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. This is what Jesus was born for. And it was clear that Jesus understood this. In Luke 2, 41, <clears throat> It says, every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. My God, imagine that. Even, even the first family, come on somebody. Even, even Jesus' parents forgot him. Isn't that an ugly feeling? Me and Ruth did that one time. Remember, babe, we were in the car already. We're like, well, we went to Walmart or somewhere. And we're like, where's Nehemiah? <laughs> well, no, no, we were in Walmart already walking around. Or, he, or forget what, but we were like, oh, my God. And we ran back and we got him. It's an ugly feeling. They forgot Jesus. And the Bible says that they were already on their way. And they're like, hey, where's Jesus? I don't know. Where do you, where's Jesus? Oh, my God. And then Mary probably was, where's Jesus? Jesus! And it even says that they started checking with all the family. It says the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a whole day. Then they began looking for him amongst their relatives and friends. He's probably with the cousin. Where's that troublemaker cousin at? Where, 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 where? That poor cousin gets blamed for everything now. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Why are you, putting, why are you stressing me out? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And here's, here's what Jesus said. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Other translations say, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business? He said, mom, did not you know I was a businessman? Didn't you know I was mission-minded? Didn't you know that there was purpose on my life? I wonder how many of us can get up today and say, I also have a calling. I also have a purpose. I'm also mission-minded. And if you're not, you can jump on. Even later in his ministry, in Matthew 16, 
From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And ultimately, Jesus declared in Luke 4, 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Imagine that. He just walked in, right? And then someone just handed him the scroll of Isaiah. He was like. I can just, like, visualize it, you know? Unrolling it, he found a place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. Imagine he's saying this to everybody. Everybody's in the temple. He runs, rolls in. He just starts speaking. He goes right to that spot. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim, proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind. To release the oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down like a boss. It doesn't say like a boss. I just put that part in there. But. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, someone say today. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What was Jesus modeling for us? He was modeling a life that was functioning according to the purposes of God. What is the desire of God for you and I? That you and I would function in the purposes that he has for our life. The Bible says that he has given every single one of us a measure of faith. He's given every single one of us gifts. He's given us opportunity. He's given us a place to work. We should desire to be like Jesus and say, Lord, I want a life that's about your business. I want to be mission-minded like Jesus. Acts 13, 36, concerning David, the Bible says, After he served the purposes of God in his own generation, he was laid to sleep with his forefathers. The fact that we, when we see this with the life of David, that he was laid to sleep with his forefathers. This was him. In other words, he passed away and he was buried. He passed away and he was buried. But the, the part that I want to bring to your attention that says after he fulfilled the purposes of God for his life in his generation. That means that God had things for David to do during that time of his life. You know, when I was a kid, I got infatuated with Vietnam, with Nam. Some of you guys are too young to know what, what, what Vietnam was about, right? And I used to think, and then I had a stepdad for a hot minute that was a Vietnam veteran, and he, like, gave me some things from Vietnam, and I was just all, I was infatuated with Vietnam, man. And then I, I saw Platoon when I was, like, 11 years old. I went to the movies, and I saw the movie Platoon. It was crazy. But I thought, oh, man, I was born too late. I should have been there with them. I should have been in the jungles, man. I should have been there in Vietnam. I, I was called to fight. I felt like God always gave me like a fighting heart, like a, a, a revolution. I, I always wanted to be in the fight. And I used to get mad. I, oh, I was born too late. For real, there was like the season where I was tripping. I should have been there. But after I got saved, I realized I got to know it wasn't my plan for you to be there. It wasn't my plan for you to be born in the, in the 60s. It wasn't my plan for me to raise you up in the 80s. I, I've called you for such a time as this. Come on, somebody. He said, I've called you for such a time as this. God is never too late. He's always right on time. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And as long as we are busy about being who God has called us to be, we won't waste time. We won't be worried, and we won't settle for less. When you are a mission-minded individual, functioning according to the plan of God for your life, then you're not going to waste time. 
When you're somebody that recognizes, man, God's called me, I got a purpose, I got a plan. You're not somebody that likes to waste time. You're also not somebody that gets worried. You're like, I'm not worried about it, right? You know, I've come to that place in my life, I'm not worried about it. If, God's, if God brings me to it, he's going to see me through it. If, if, if I got mud on my face, maybe there's a reason I got mud on my face. If I get served a slice of humble pie, maybe God wants somebody to see me eating humble pie and somehow it's going to encourage them. I don't know what God is going to do, but I know that if he brings me to it, he's going to see me through it. I know he's faithful to lead me through the valley. Hallelujah. You won't be worried when you're functioning according to God's plan and you won't settle for less. He said, no, man, I don't want no second, be second best play and save blessing. Someone needs to grab that to, huh, this morning. Say, no, man, I want, I want the, right? I don't, want, I don't want that one that looks like the one from the alleys that looks like the real one. I want the real one. Huh? Some of you need to take that, you say, well, for the person that God has for you. So I'm not going to be settling for this half big second best option, option number eight over here. Oh, I might have to be single for another year. I might have to be single for two more years. I may have, but I know when it happens, it's going to be the one that God wants for me. Huh? That's even with jobs, you got to be careful because not all money is good money. You may take a job, oh, look at this job, and it pulls you away from where God wanted you to be. I'm telling you that when you're a mission-minded individual, you won't waste time, you won't be worried, and you won't settle for less. Come on, give the Lord a good hand of praise. Stand with me this morning. The last point, I don't have time to break it down. But God desires his people to be fighting. Not fighting with each other. Fighting for what God's given to us. I'm so amazed at times how little God's people fight. Especially in our ministry, I know that many of us were fighters in the world. Someone said something to what? Well, quick to get up, quick to ball your fist, quick to. Someone didn't give you the respect you thought, or you maybe whatever. It's a, they said something about your mama, you were like. What'd you say about my mama? I know there's some of us quick to get up to get your order wrong. Excuse me. Excuse me. We were leaving Dodger Stadium last night. And my God, it was like people were like, man, fuck, you know. You saw the fighters and the not fighters right there, right? Kenny was driving. I was like, Kenny's a fighter. And he was aggressively passing by people that were not fighters. Watch out. Right? No, I'm just kidding. I just put my hat low and I rolled my window up. I was like, oh, my God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> But it's amazing to me how when it comes to God's people fighting for what God has given to them, how sometimes there's not the right amount of fight. We give up on the call of God. We give up on the people. We give up on our brothers. We give up on our church. We give up on our ministries. We, we sometimes don't get up with the fight that we need to have. And God is desiring for his men and women to fight. Come on, somebody. Paul told Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. He didn't say just sit there and put your hand out and it's going to fall into your hand. He said, Timothy, fight the good fight and lay hold. I'm telling you, some of you, that God has great blessings in store for you. Some of you, God has called you, but you got to lay hold of it. You got to be willing to fight for it. 2 Samuel 21, verse 15, it speaks about a time when the Philistines were at war with Israel. And David went out to fight. David was fighting and he, he, was, he was the leader, man. He was the anointed one. He, he was the, the one that the men loved and looked at and, and God was pleased with. He was a man after God's own heart. They said he was like the flame of Israel. And while he was at battle, man, he got tired. He was fighting. He got tired and his sword wasn't making it all the way up. 
And all of a sudden, man, one of the enemies, they saw that. And they made a move to come in. They said, now's my chance to kill David. But Abishai, Abishai said, no, man, not on my watch, man. I, this is a fight worth fighting. This is a fight worth fighting. I'm going to get up and I'm going to protect what God has given me. I'm going to fight for what God has given me. I'm going to fight for my children. I'm going to fight for my ministry. I'm going to fight for everything that God wants to do in my life. Come on, Victory Aries, lift your hands towards heaven this morning. These are the desires of God. Oh, he desires you to be forgiven. He desires you to be free this morning. He desires you to be filled this morning. To be formed, to function, and to fight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that every single one of those points is speaking to somebody this morning. Well, thanks for joining us here at Victory Outreach West Covina. We hope you enjoyed your time. Also, I want to encourage you to subscribe and click the notification bell. That way you get notified every time we go live. You won't miss a service. Stay connected with us. And you can also partner with us in your giving if you want to bless the ministry financially so we can continue the work that God is doing here. You can do that at any time. I hope you share it. And I hope you come visit us live real soon. God bless you.